Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marentet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. Dr. Ahmed will be providing the EPI summary report today, but first I will share the most current case counts. There are 100,220 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 32,917 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 156 cases and Sarnia-Lampton has reported 281 cases. Michigan now has 60,618 cases with 11,318 cases being in Detroit. Today we are reporting 1,263 cases of COVID-19 in our community, an increase of 19 cases from yesterday. 17 people work in the agri-farm sector, two people are household contacts of a case. 730 cases have now resolved, 451 cases or people are self-isolating and two people are in hospital. 22% of our cases are between the ages of 20 and 29 years, 20% are between the ages of 30 and 39 years, and 17% of our cases are between the ages of 40 and 49 years. 55% are male and 44% are female with 1% as unknown at this time. Our community has lost a total of 67 people to COVID-19. 49 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care and retirement homes. There are currently two long-term care homes that are experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. And there are currently eight workplaces in the agriculture sector that are experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. Symptoms of COVID-19 range from mild respiratory or flu-like symptoms to severe symptoms. Some common symptoms include fever, a new or worsening cough, a barking cough, chills, sore throat, and shortness of breath. Call 911 if you have difficulty breathing and are struggling to breathe or speak, or are experiencing severe chest pain, or if you are feeling confused or losing consciousness. Please be reminded that Windsor-Essex has two COVID-19 assessment centers, Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington and Windsor Regional Hospital Olette Campus. SOHAC, the Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access Centre in Windsor, also offers testing for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people and their families. Please continue to visit our website at wechu.org for the most current information and case counts. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health, for the EPI Summary Report. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us again. Since the beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic, the staff at Windsor-Essex County Health Unit has been working tirelessly to protect and promote the health of and well-being of our community. It's been more than three months your public health unit staff have been working at least 10 to 12 hours a day and seven days a week to keep the community safe and protect the health of the public. The goals of COVID-19 pandemic was uh, fourfold. First one was to save lives, and we have done a pretty good job in terms of saving that life overall. The second goal was to reduce the morbidity and mortality and the spread of the containment of the disease, which was also um, um, done very well. In terms of the, uh, the third goal, it was the protecting the healthcare system in general to prevent any surge and massive influx of cases and diseases in the community. So we have seen that that didn't happen as well. The fourth goal of this COVID-19 pandemic was to reduce the economic and societal impacts uh, in the community. As we are seeing more and more regions opening up in the province, more people congregating and spending time outdoors, it is important to, organize, to recognize what are some of the additional measures we need to put in place to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone and prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our region. As we are constantly looking at new research emerging from all around the world, we made a recommendation to wear a cloth mask in areas where physical distancing is not possible, for example, grocery stores and transits. We got a good respond in our, response in our community and many people are wearing the mask and are not uh, many people are wearing the mask when they are in these, these places. However, there are others 
who are not wearing the mask and are not necessarily practicing physical distancing. In order for us to be ready to move forward to stage two reopening, we are looking at additional measures that would give us more confidence in how we are keeping our community safe. Starting next week, there will be a mandatory mask policy in all commercial establishments in Windsor and Essex. This should give all area residents a lead time and business establishments some lead time to have policies in place to require a cloth mask to enter each of the business establishment. Having a mandatory mask policy at all commercial establishment will make it everyone's responsibility to play their part in reducing the transmission. Please remember, masks do not replace the need for physical distancing and it do not protect you from COVID-19, the person who is wearing it, but in fact, it protects others from the person wearing the mask if they develop any symptoms of COVID-19. Please visit our website for details on cloth mask, how to wear the mask safely, and any other questions related to mask that you may, uh, that you may have. We will be sharing more details on the specific requirements for masking every uh, early next week. Mandatory mask at every commercial establishment will help us feel more confident about our COVID-19 containment and will help us move further in the right direction towards stage two reopening. We'll now move on to the weekly epi summary. So very quickly, once again, this is what we will cover in our presentation, and I'll focus on the key point to answer some of the questions that we've been uh, looking to answer. The epidemic curve uh, help us assess the progression of the disease, whether in the community or in an outbreak situation. Uh, this particular epi curve is created to show the number of confirmed cases uh, and uh, by their symptom onset date. On your vertical axis, you have confirmed cases. On the horizontal axis, we have the deaths uh, sorry, we have the dates these, uh, these cases started showing symptoms. The significance of using symptom onset date helps us assess whether when the transmission or exposure is happening. The day-to-day -day variation in order to accumulate for that day-to-day -day variation, the another way to look at it is by looking at the three-day moving average. Three-day moving average help us capture uh, some of these variation and we can see roughly since uh, second and third week of April, we saw a decline in the case count, and then we have seen some peaks coming into the, the, to the month of May. Please note that the data represented in the shaded area may not be reported yet to public health and may not be entirely accurate and subject to change. This figure further breaks down the cases by long-term care home and retirement home and those who are working in the agri-farm industry and everyone else not in, the, uh, not in the first two groups. We can see a spike in the, in the third, uh, third week of uh, May uh, among those working in the agri-farm industry. Please note that the orange bar includes both individuals who are temporary foreign workers and those who are residents of Windsor-Essex, but they are working in the agri-farm industry. As of June 17th, we currently have 374 cases that are workers in the agri-farm industry, making up 30% of our overall cases to date. So this figure looks at the case counts of Windsor-Essex when we remove the cases from the long-term care home, retirement home, including staff, and agri-farm uh, workers. So this is a true representation of what is happening in the community in terms of uh, the cases uh, and where it's spreading. So if you remove all these agri-farm industry and if you remove the long-term care home, we can see that the community spread or the community cases in the community is, is, is significantly low uh, and well within uh, the five or six cases a day average uh, since the uh, last couple of months. One, way of the, one of the common methods of looking at how we are doing is also using a seven-day moving average to look at our overall trend. The blue line looks at all our cases using a seven-day moving average. We can see a peak in the late March and in April, and the latter attributed to the out outbreaks in the long-term care home and retirement home. We are currently seeing another peak in the agri-farm worker population in late May, and thus uh, so far in June. The green line is looking at the seven-day moving average if we were to remove the workers in the agri-farm industry. You will notice that the seven-day moving average declines dramatic, dramatically from May onwards when it's taken into the effect. So 
So looking at how we are doing uh, compared to the rest of the province, and, uh, uh, and we can see that Windsor and Essex has the fourth highest rate in the province, and our rates are, um, and our rates are higher than the provincial average. For us here locally, we have experienced a higher proportion of cases in long-term care home, retirement home, currently 24%, but it's, at its peak, it was, that was 42%, including the staff and the residents in the long-term care home. We are now currently seeing an increase in the number of individuals in the agri-farm sector who are, that constitute 30% of our total cases. Uh, looking at the overall case by age and sex, and this is what it looks like in the past two weeks. Um, and overall compared to uh, the, the past two weeks. So we have seen an increase in, in the age group uh, between 20 and 50, where we have seen an increase uh, in that particular age group, but overall male are more, uh, more constitute more cases in the last two weeks, and even overall in the, in the community. This particular graph shows the distribution of COVID-19 cases by each of the municipalities. Currently, 44% of our cases are from Windsor and the rest are from the county. We are seeing almost 30% of our cases from the Leamington area, and this is due to the uptake of cases in the agri-farm sector. Breaking it further down into what's happening in the last 30 days of uh, distribution of COVID-19 cases by each of the municipality, uh, and we can see that uh, Leamington constitutes 63% of the cases, while the rest of the county case counts is relatively stable overall, and also Kingsville, um, and both these regions are constituting these cases uh, because of the agri-farm industry um, uh, workers uh, uh, constituting the cases. Going further down into the seven day, last seven days uh, case distribution, we have seen that uh, Leamington constituted a little over half of the cases, where El Kingsville constituted 35% of the cases, where the rest of the municipalities uh, have uh, a low number of cases overall. Through the extensive contact tracing by the health unit is caring, we are able to identify the majority of the cases as close contacts and this include close contact in a household, long-term care home, retirement home, congregate settings, such as shelters and migrant farm. So we can see in this particular graph that the travel-related cases have pretty much gone down uh, to zero, whereas most of the cases that we are seeing are in close contacts, which is, which is good from a uh, public health containment perspective, that uh, uh, we are following up, we are, that we are tracking all these individuals down, and all these people who require self-isolation are, are being addressed at the appropriate time to ensure the safety of the community. So all of those indicators are going in the right direction. We are seeing very few community transmission as we are moving forward and is still continue to see that. So look, uh, breaking it down further from exposure history by reported date among agri-farm workers in the past 30 days. Uh, so this graph is looking at the, the majority of cases have acquired primarily through the close contacts, and we are seeing this instances where uh, we are seeing some instances where it's also a community acquired. Um, and uh, majority of these cases, as we know, these agri-farm sector um, people are living in shared accommodation in, in congregate settings. That makes them that make them vulnerable to to contract cases uh, much higher than the uh, the general population. Looking at COVID-19 cases by healthcare worker status, um, so this is what it looks like. Initially, we have seen up to 36% uh, to 40% of the cases in the healthcare workers, uh, which is now going down to pretty much 19% uh, of the total cases overall since the beginning. But as we have identified um, lately, those numbers are, are significantly lower compared to what we have seen in the initial uh, stages of COVID-19. So some of the underlying chronic health conditions that we have noticed uh, in, the, in these cases, the majority of them had no chronic uh, underlying health condition. 32% of, of the cases that we have seen in our region had some kind of a chronic underlying or immunocompromised situation, uh, conditions that puts them at a higher risk of developing uh, more severity uh, with COVID-19. Another look at what these cases, uh, about these cases and what symptoms they are reporting. 71% of our cases had some type of cough, either new, worsening, or productive cough. Uh, but please note that uh, many of these cases are reporting more than one symptom, so these numbers may not add up. 
the other indications in addition to the to the actual case count that we are looking uh, to assess the capacity or assess the uh, the the uh, how the region is doing is to look at the health system capacity. So what we are looking at at this particular graph is showing that the COVID hospitalizations and patients in the ICU on any given day, it can include both new patients and existing patients with COVID-19. Cases in the ICU remain relatively low and have stabilized to one case. Uh, the red line indicates the seven day moving average in the ICU showing a decreasing trend in the ICU as well. So hospitalization have fluctuated more so than the ICU but we have seen a sharp decline in the number of inpatients hospitalization for COVID-19 in the past two weeks. Looking at the health system, healthcare system capacity, uh, the orange line highlights the occupancy rate of our acute beds in, in Windsor and Essex. Um, the threshold is to have the occupancy rate below 85%, which we are currently meeting. The signals that we are currently able to meet the demands related to COVID if, it's, if it increase. For ICU capacity, we look at the overall ICU capacity and ICU ventilator beds. While there is no established threshold or criteria to, uh, to, to, to make it standard that how much we, we, with the capacity we should be looking at, the overall aim continues to be less than 50% of, uh, of uh, the capacity. Higher than this may lead to the stress in the healthcare system if COVID-19 cases increases within the Windsor Essex. And so far, we are, uh, we are also meeting that, uh, that needs uh, fairly well. So where are we with all these cases? Uh, we can see that 58% uh, of our cases are resolved, approximately 35% are self-isolating, uh, and uh, unfortunately we lost 5% of the cases to COVID-19. Looking further at the age and sex breakdown of uh, the people who lost their lives to COVID-19, overall more female died with COVID diagnosis compared to males. From an age distribution perspective, almost 70% of the death were in individuals who were 80 years and older. The youngest person who died was a, the, a man in his 20s. This particular graph shows that what it means for an individual who contracts COVID-19. In our community, the overall case fatality rate is 5.4%, which is a decrease from last week. Those who are living in the long-term care home and retirement home Case fatality is significantly high, 16.3% in this age group. But if we compare this number from uh, the com numbers in Ontario, which is, uh, which is uh, higher than uh, each of these categories compared to Windsor and Essex. The, the Ontario case fatality rate for long-term care home is higher than the, our case fatality rate by at least 6%. And same with the overall case, uh, uh, overall Windsor Essex compared to the provincial average, we are at least down 2% uh, less than the uh, overall number in Ontario. As many of you are aware that we did uh, the random drive-through testing in Windsor and Essex, so now we have data for all of those cases uh, that uh, all, all of the people who visited our facility and look at the number of people who are positive, uh, asymptomatic positive and symptomatic positive, and uh, the breakdown of all those details are there in total. We, we tested more than a little over uh, 4,900 and 4,916 to be precise, and only eight individuals have, have tested positive so far. Three showed symptoms when we swabbed them and five had no symptoms. Uh, the snapshot provide us with the good news as even with the testing almost close to 5,000 residents, the, the across Windsor Essex, only eight or 0.2% tested positive. When we are looking at these, these numbers from a community perspective, um, obviously this is a good sign because of what we are looking is we are going down into each of these community and giving an opportunity to anyone who feels that either they have symptoms or even if they don't have symptoms. So what's the current prevalence of uh, COVID-19 uh, in our community? So this is, a, this, is a, this is the step that we took. We did some sample size calculation to find, identify the, uh, the appropriate number that we need to answer this question. And based on that method, we are, uh, we are looking at these numbers, which, fairly, which gives us a good confidence in terms of the true spread and true uh, uh, situation of our entire community in Windsor and Essex.
Looking at the case doubling time, it tells us what we are seeing that uh, in the beginning, obviously the, the, the doubling rate was pretty high, but we have well passed the doubling rate uh, for uh, more than six days now, but this is a cumulative comparison since we started. Looking at the doubling time over day-to-day -day comparison, we can see that, uh, uh, that overall as a country, we're moving in the right direction. We have seen some variability in Ontario, but uh, the case counts have declined. In Windsor and Essex, day-to-day -day over doubling time has dropped due to the high number of cases we have seen in the past couple of weeks, but those numbers are getting closer to the uh, overall uh, Ontario number um, um, as well. Looking at the most recent um, uh, effective, uh, are not effective, and uh, are not effective is basically is based off the symptom onset date, and it is an indicator of if someone develops COVID-19, how many more individuals that these person can, uh, are, are, can spread it to other. When the R0 is greater than one, each existing infection can cause more than one new cases. And our R0 estimate increased, uh, has increased recently due to the cases in the agri-farm, but overall we stayed uh, below one, which is, uh, which, is, which, is, which is where we want to be and bringing it down further to, uh, to, to the situation where we can see that the number of cases are going down eventually. When the R0 is less than one, that means every infection caused less than one new infection, signaling a decrease in the virus in the community. And even though we are below one, we have seen, we have seen some variation recently, but overall our, our trend and our, uh, and our numbers uh, for R0 was, uh, stayed below one. So in summary, Windsor Essex has continued to see a high number of cases uh, more recently uh, are attributed to the agri-farm sector. And the primary source of exposure continued to be through close contact with confirmed cases. The hospitalization and ICU capacity are well within expected thresholds. The random testing has yielded very few positive in our community, which is a good indicator from a community perspective and community spread perspective. Um, our not effective value is less than one, signaling a decrease in the spread of COVID-19 in our community but we have seen some uh, variation in the past few weeks. Thank you. The conference is now unmuted. Okay. Uh, hold on. To our first round of questions, uh, CBC, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Dr. Ahmed, can you just, um, let us know how many active cases there are. So sorry, I think I missed it off the top. Um, active cases overall, uh, that number will have to, yeah, the active cases. So we, we reported that at least 35% of these cases are self-isolating. So if we go with that number, we can say that we have at least uh, 450 or so cases uh, that are currently active in our community. But many of, the, many of these cases uh, are moving into the uh, resolved case uh, situation. Uh, customers are adhering to this um, this recommendation. Uh, that's the idea that uh, it would be uh, uh, the business establishment who would be setting up these uh, these recommendations for uh, everyone, and we will be uh, we will be working with them to uh, to work on the specific language that they need. Uh, but that would be our uh, requirement from a public health perspective that the business establishment should uh, have policies in place that would uh, uh, that, that would ensure that people who are coming to those commercial establishment. And, uh, and we'll, we'll make a, a distinction as well that what is meant by commercial establishment and which, what, which of these facilities are there. We know that some of these businesses are already implementing such policies. Uh, we'd like to see it applied more broadly and ensuring that uh, they, are, uh, they are very clear in terms of the expectation 
the public is very clear in terms of the expectation and uh, when they're visiting these commercial establishments um, the uh, the signage the policies that each of these businesses need are are uh, are available but it, it would be the uh, the to the individual to bring their own mask before they go into the facility uh, the business establishment can facilitate that as well but those are some of the details that we'll still have to uh, work out and uh, share in in the in the coming weeks but we want to make sure that this we are uh, sharing that information so people, if uh, they haven't uh, been using masks or if they don't have access to masks, they can, they can try and uh, get that if they are visiting any of these uh, uh, commercial establishments uh, before it's, it's in a, it's, it becomes mandatory. Okay, and, and just to be clear, we're talking about commercial businesses like stores and things like that, but not necessarily workplaces and like employees and things. Well, we our recommendations have always been there to uh, to uh, to use cloth mask where physical distancing is not possible. So basically, this is uh, building up on the same recommendations and ensuring that the expectation and understanding is clear. And uh, as mentioned, many of these businesses are already having these policies in place. Many of the people who are visiting these commercial establishments are also already following this recommendation. Uh, we want to make sure that the expectation is clearly laid out uh, for everyone uh, to ensure that. That, uh, everyone is following the recommendation and protecting everyone in the community and playing their part. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Blackburn. Yeah, I was just looking, you're looking at the data about like doubling time in the community and the R not. Has there been any figures done about what that time would be among the migrant farm population? Like, is it growing a lot? faster in that population I mean obviously it is but is there any have you done any calculations to that effect uh, so what we can say is uh, is uh, with the low numbers sometimes it may not be possible to do an accurate ca calculation for R not uh, what we have seen is in terms of the number of cases that we are seeing um, in these uh, in these farm population and the source of uh, the transmission so we are seeing in one of the graph I did show uh, the uh, the epi curve by the uh, by by agri farm workers uh, cases so if you look at that you can see a trend but not necessarily getting down into the R not uh, specific calculation the other thing that I can say on an average when we are talking about the general co general community uh, the average number of contacts that we are looking for is probably close to uh, less than five but uh, when we are looking at this population, we have case uh, uh, close contacts identified at least eight to ten. So uh, clearly, it's almost like more than double the number that we see in in the general community versus in this community, uh, and it's uh, partly uh, or in fact major uh, because of uh, their shared accommodation arrangements and congregate living settings. Thank you. Okay, uh, Windsor. Um, uh, you said it was going to start next week, the mandatory mask policy. Uh, what day next week are you targeting for that? So as I mentioned, that uh, we'll, be, we'll be sharing some of those details. We, we just wanted to make sure that all the things are in place before we, go, we uh, land on a specific date. Um, so details you will see on Monday with the specific implementation date. Okay, and, uh, thinking that employees will also be requ required to wear masks? So commercial establishment, uh, the idea is uh, everyone should be while in that uh, in that uh, business establishment or commercial establishment uh, that includes employee as well as uh, anyone who is visiting. And uh, aside from the obvious stores and, and that sort of stuff, are there any other types of businesses that you're thinking that would be targeted such as churches or uh, drive-in movie theaters? Uh, not necessarily. I think this is just for more uh, to um, um, depending on what the where where we are heading down with respect to the reopening. Uh, there is no such requirement uh, and uh, among the religious establishment at this stage. Uh, but uh, we'll be constantly looking at the need, and uh, we know that some of the religious establishments are already asking their uh, worshippers to wear the mask. Um, but uh, that would be uh, that would be something that we'll look at. But right now, the focus is on the commercial establishments. Thank you. Uh, Windsor Star. Is there a precedent for this uh, mask mand mandating in other any other regions in the province? 
Uh, the only other region that has mandated this mask is uh, Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph. Uh, so that's the only region in Ontario um, that has this mandatory requirement uh, for commercial establishment. And, and just to be clear, this is because you are seeing in the community that there are people who are not following social distancing and therefore also not wearing a mask. It's a combination. Both. Uh, we, we do feel that uh, there are a good number of people who are doing that and there are people who are not doing it. And also in terms of for us to, to, to be better prepared for moving into stage two, I think it's important that we, we look at all other ways to ensuring that uh, with the influx of the people visiting these commercial establishments going into these businesses, we have uh, better ways to uh, to try and contain the disease, and uh, uh, so that's that's the rationale behind. So it's it's a combination of both. It's also to prepare us to move us to the stage two, and also to uh, to make it a level playing field for everyone, and uh, expect everyone to wear masks because we can we can easily see the people who are wearing masks and following all those physical distancing, and when in the same settings. If someone is not wearing a mask or not following physical distancing, it just makes uh, uh, things more challenging. So in order to make it a, a, an even playing field, we want to make sure that uh, everyone is following that. And just like a no, shoot, no shoes, no shirt, no service policy, uh, businesses are totally in their right to deny business to somebody who's not wearing a mask. Is that true? That is the idea, and uh, but that would be backed by our recommendation. So that would uh, obviously will help uh, the business to uh, to use that uh, as uh, as the as their policy uh, business policy to uh, to enforce that. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to check. Uh, is AM800? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, you had mentioned that this is something that you're looking at doing or that you will be implementing as a way to help us get to stage two. So uh, was this something that was suggested from the provincial level that has come down to you or is this just a proactive step that you are taking? Uh, no, this is a proactive step that we are taking. And uh, it, just like we have said that uh, the recommendation was al always there, uh, it's just being more formalized and ensuring that it's there uh, for us. And as we prepare to move into this stage two, uh, that's definitely something that would uh, give me more confidence and give the community more confidence uh, before we move to the uh, stage two. And uh, there's always been age recommendations for the masks. So if somebody does have to take uh, a younger person into a store with them, um, will this include kids? I think, I feel like 12 was the maybe recommended age where under that kids don't have to wear masks, but will that change? Uh, so there are, there will be specific exceptions. Uh, so the recommendation has always been for face mask is to, face mask is to use uh, in children at least older than two years and above. And uh, right now I think uh, the best thing that you can do is not to take your children to, into stores if, uh, if at all possible, if they cannot wear the mask or if they're too young to wear a mask. So that's in their, in, the, in their best interest. But having said that, all those details and exceptions will be there because there will be people who, for medical reason, may, not, may be unable to wear the mask. So all those exceptions will be clearly laid out as well. That uh, that it, as much as it's 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 the expectation for everyone to wear the mask with some with uh, with with some individuals who are unable to wear the mask. And again, going back to reflecting it back into the to the business establishment. So we're not expecting that if someone cannot wear a mask for any reason to carry uh, some kind of a letter from a doctor to say that I cannot wear a mask because of this, this, this reason. But at least it would be something that uh, that uh, that would be uh, like a, it shouldn't be asked or requested, uh, but something that needs to be considered that there will be people who for medical reason or any other reason could not wear a mask. And uh, we don't want to create this inequity. Um, so we we'll, we'll, we want to make sure that some exemptions are in place for those individuals, but for the general public, the recommendation would be uh, to mandatory wear a mask while in the commercial establishment. Okay, sorry. So you said it will or it won't be required to have some type of like doctor's or medical note. It won't. Be. It won't be any requirement. It would be. It would be more on the individuals. I guess we'll have to. We'll have to take them uh, uh, their word uh, as. A, and and I'm and I'm sure people will be truthful in what they're saying. We don't want to create more barriers that now you need a letter or you need something. So that won't be in place. So it would be obviously in in, in your uh, you being truthful in sharing. But uh, the the idea is uh, if. Uh, everyone is wearing, there will be very few people with the exception, uh, and we don't want to burden them by asking all those requests. Okay. 
And lastly, um, you said that more details will be released on Monday. So could you just outline maybe a few examples of what these details will be that you'll be uh, giving more specific information on? So one thing, they, uh, it would be the, the, the implementation date, that what's the expectation for the implementation date. The other details would be what type, what constitutes a commercial establishment, being very specific and uh, identifying that uh, what are some of the examples look like uh, in terms of the policy, what it looks like for the business establishment, in terms of uh, um, um, the exceptions, that what, uh, what, would be accept, uh, what would be considered as an exception for individuals who cannot wear masks. So all those details will be there. Okay, thank you. Okay, is uh just gonna check in if is Radio Canada on? Uh C T V. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? No thank you. No thanks. Uh, when it comes to medical exceptions, um, just coming to mind, things like a COPD, is that something you're thinking of, people who have already have breathing difficulties? Yes, yeah. So there are uh, certain medical condition uh, with breathing difficulty and uh, people who may have, like as you identified, COPD, any heart disease condition, which, which prevents them from wearing a mask for a longer period of time. Uh, so all those details we'll be looking at and uh, without, again, I, I don't want to go on to an exhaustive list of medical condition that put people at risk of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. I think majority of the people can wear a mask. Uh, so we, we, we'll try to put some language in there for clarity, but uh, that's the idea that uh, there will be people who may not uh, wear the mask uh, like everyone else. Thank you. Uh, just a question about the uh, random testing. So 4,916 uh, tests were conducted and eight were positive. Uh, does that mean that 4,908, uh, you know, the remaining, were they came back negative? That is correct, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, any further questions, CBC? No, thank you. Any further questions, Windsor Star? No, thank you. Uh, AM800? No, I'm good, thank you. Blackburn, any further questions? No, thanks. Windsorite? No, thanks. Okay, have a great day.